Well, once again, we want to thank you. I want to thank you for allowing us into your living room this evening on this Easter Saturday. So once again, I want to share a word in connection with this weekend that we're talking about, Easter weekend. So we know that the Word of God tells us, as, as Christians, we're taught to be Christ-like. But what does it truly mean to be, to be like Christ, for instance? We look over in the book of John, where Jesus turns to Simon and he says, uh, he asks him if he loves him. Now, Jesus doesn't do this necessarily to hear Simon Peter loves him, but to redeem him from denying Christ before he was crucified. Jesus also uses, uh, uses this moment as a chance. It's a chance to teach Peter Simon a very valuable lesson. He starts off by using his sheep as a metaphor for God's people. To truly serve the Lord, you must love, trust, honour and obey. And we, we do this by following what God has called us to do. In other words, to glorify him, very importantly, by taking care of his people as you care for yourself. Now, we know that Jesus demonstrates this in a different way with John 13. Because here, he washes the disciples' feet, and particularly Simon Peter's. Because after he finished washing their feet, Jesus explains to the disciples that while they call him teacher and Lord, they should also watch, wash each other's feet, meaning they should also serve each other. And he goes on to say, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Now, this is right across the word of God. You should do as I have done for you. So very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. So getting back to this, to be Christ-like, it says we must serve each other as Christ served us. We do this through what? Loving each other through the gifts that God gave each of us. You know, to love somebody, you need to work on it sometimes. But if you get the gift from God, it becomes much easier. So maybe you can do this through writing, play music, or perhaps it's through science or even cleaning houses. Regardless, through that servant-loving attitude that we can truly be Christ-like, ask yourself today, whose feet do I need to wash today? What do I need to serve and show? Who do I need to serve and show love towards? Well, we're all called equal. None of us are better than the other. And we're all loved in the eyes of the Lord. So I want to go over to John 13, John 13 and chapter 1. Now this is before the Passover. Jesus knew that he, his hour had come to leave this world and return to his Father. Now he loves his disciples during his ministry on the earth and now he loved them to the very end. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist and he poured water into a basin. You can imagine the disciples saying, what's this guy up to now? And he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around them. Now in verse 6, when Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I'm doing, but someday you will. Now I want to stop at that there, because that statement could apply to you and me today. You don't understand what God is doing right now, but someday you will. Now for the disciples, that someday started on Pentecost when all those who were present in the upper room received the Holy Spirit and they became born again. Before this point, the disciples were operating in the sense knowledge. Now, I'll give you an idea. Over If you go over to 1 Corinthians 1.18, imagine this is what the Bible says. The message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. But we who are being saved know it's the very power of God. And as the scriptures say, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, discard the intelligence of the intellect. So where does this leave the philosophers, the scholars and the world's brilliant debaters? God has made the wisdom of this world look foolish. Since God and his wisdom saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom. We need to understand that. You won't get to know God through human wisdom. He has, he has used the foolish 
preaching to save those who believe. I always keep saying, point and question. He has me sharing the gospel with you now. So in verse 22, he goes on to explain, it's foolishness to the Jews who ask for signs from heaven, and it's foolish to the Greeks. They seek human wisdom. So when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended. And the Gentiles say, it's all nonsense. So back to that scripture, verse 8. No, Peter protested, you'll never wash my feet. And Jesus replies, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Now that could be, he has to wash us all through the blood of Jesus. But that's, I'll come back to that in a minute. So Jesus explained, or Peter explained when he said that to him, unless I, I wash you, you won't belong to me. So Peter said then, wash my hands, my head as well, not just my feet, Lord. But after washing his feet, he put on his robe again. He sat down and asked them, Do you understand what I was doing? Verse 13. You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, because that's what I am. And since I am your Lord and teacher, I've washed your feet. You ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. And I tell the truth. Slaves are not greater than their master, nor the messenger is more important than the one who sent the message. Now, know these things, and God will bless you for doing them. Now, there's a wonderful description that says, greater things. Well, you know, the Bible talks about greater things, and we want all those, don't we? We want a greater paycheck. We want greater experiences. We want greater vacations, especially at this time. And of course, we want greater relationships, a better job. In the Bible, we see a long trajectory of greater things. Now, let me explain to you what that all means. Jesus was celebrating the Passover with his disciples. Now, understand that this was one of the most important feasts of the holidays on the Jewish calendar. It's, what does it do? It celebrates the impossible. When God's servant Moses led the people of Israel out of slavery and bondage in Egypt. Now that's over in, Deut in Deuteronomy 4.24, for instance. He talks about it here. He says, has any God ever tried to take for himself one nation out of another nation? by testing, by signs and wonders, by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, or by great and awesome deeds, like all the things the Lord has done. God did this, he did this for you in Egypt before your very eyes. Now, the Exodus was truly incredible, in the sense of unbelievable. No one could ever have made up such a strange and miraculous story. It's part of the Festival of Unleavened Bread, which is also called the Passover. And uh, it says here, when the Passover was approaching, the high priests and the teachers of religious law, they were plotting at this time how to kill Jesus. But they were afraid of the people's reaction. And at that time, Satan entered into Judas Iscariot, who was one of the 12 disciples. And he went to do to the leading priests, the captains of the temple, the temple guard, to discuss the best way to betray Jesus to them. Now, of course, they were delighted. They promised to give him money. So he agreed and he began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus so that they could arrest him, and very importantly, when the crowds weren't around. So each year of Passover, those who celebrate remember God's great deliverance. And in the first century, the people of Israel could not wait for God to bring a new exodus from under the Roman oppression. The Passover season was like a powder keg in Jerusalem. And the Romans, they stationed many soldiers here to enforce a zero tolerance policy on anyone who tried to start to live a revolution. A bit like we had 25,000 guards out to stop people demonstrating against the lockdown but I don't think they were trying to start a revolution. However, Jesus took the opportunity at the Last Supper to tell the Passover story in a new way. With himself at the centre, he is the unleveled bread. 
He is the wine, symbolising the blood on the doorpost to protect those inside the house. He is Moses, leading the people out from bondage to the terrible powers of sin and death. Now un understand this. this. I got this revelation and putting this together myself. Never mind the Romans. There are deeper issues in every human heart. So the question is, which Passover is greater? Vanishing, vanquishing the Egyptians or evil spiritual forces? See, the Gospel of John, he highlights this theme of greater things. Jesus tells Nathaniel when he calls him, you believe because I told you I saw you sitting under the fig tree. Then he says this amazing thing. You will see greater things than that. Now Jesus fights against the powers of death, unclean spirits, disease, hunger, scarcity, exclusion, and an expression throughout his ministry. He brings life and deliverance wherever he goes. And then, as he sits with his disciples at the Last Supper, this is in John 13, verse 14, Jesus offers the final teaching and encouragement. And he says these words, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing, and they will do even greater things because I'm going to the Father. Now, Often the disciples did not understand what Jesus was telling them. And especially in this situation, have you ever thought about, dealt with this issue when Jesus said, I'm, I'm going to, you'll be doing greater things because I'm going to the Father. And I'm going to explain that just now in a moment. As the disciples didn't understand what Jesus was telling them, surely this comment was as cryptic as any other, like a crossword puzzle. There was a few hints, but they didn't really understand it. But here's the deal. After his resurrection, Jesus commissions his disciples to proclaim the good news that he is king of all creation and to all nations. And he promises to be with his, his apostles until the very end. Now we can go over to Matthew to get this here. Matthew 28, verse 18. Now Jesus told his disciples, I have given you all authority in heaven and earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey all, all the commands that I have given you. And he says here, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even till the end of the age. Well, Jesus is always present with his people by the Holy Spirit. See, God's Spirit continues the Bible's stunning storyline, allowing people to do even greater things. Now, I want to just emphasize this, doing great. What's he talking about here? Have you done greater things since you've come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Well, what he was really talking about, understand this, the apostles weren't born again until Pentecost. That's when they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And of course, the greater things is that I'm standing here talking to you giving you the information. And if you take the information on board, repent of your sins, accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and invite him into your heart, they're the greater things he's talking about. Because that means somebody shared the gospel with me, I gave my life to Jesus, and now I'm on my way to heaven. No strings attached. They're the greater things he was referring to. Many people, we say, have a favourite place, a place of comfort, a place of peace, or a place to rest. And maybe it's a place of prayer or deep thought. Now, the Garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives was such a place for Jesus and his disciples. Something unfolded there that would forever change how they felt about Gethsemane. As they finished the Last Supper, Jesus tells Judas Iscariot to do what he needs to do. Now, none of the other disciples understood what he means. In John 13, 21, Judas had arranged with the leaders, as we know, with the people, who despised Jesus, and he was, he was going to lead them to Jesus with no crowd around, remember, because the people wouldn't have allowed it to happen. And what better place than the one where the disciples always went with Jesus to get away from the crowds? After they finished the feast, they got into the usual place, this is in Luke 22, 39. 
And uh, Jesus knows what is about to happen in the next 24 hours. Now, this is important. He prays for strength and asks his disciples to do the same. Then just as Jesus expected, Judas leads the temple guards right to Jesus. Why? Again, this betrayal was so important. At every turn, Jesus is reliving the history of Israel. He faces all our tests. He responds in the right way. For instance, Jesus is in the wilderness for 40 days. The devil tempts him to take a shortcut to get to his destination, the redemption of humanity. Similarly, the people of Israel were in the wilderness for 40 years, but they, before they reached their goal, the land that was promised to them. But each time Israel was tested, she chose the wrong path. And sometimes that applies to us today. We get tested and we choose the wrong path. Well, Jesus took up the story of Israel. He lived it in a fitting way, the way God called Israel to live. So Jesus is the true Israel, fulfilling the promises to Abraham to bring blessings to all nations. So the details of how Judas betrays Jesus, they show up two points in Israel's story. We see the intimacy of their friendship. Now, this was prophesied going back in the Psalms well before thousand years beforehand. There's always a, a prophecy that to the point, to the exact point what was going to happen, happened. And this is what the words say in Psalm 41, verse 9. That's over in the Old Testament. Even my best friend, the one I trusted completely, the one who shared my food, has turned against me. And we see Judah's negotiation with the leaders in Zechariah, and he says over here in Zechariah 11, 11 and 12, 11 verse 12, and I said to them, if you like to give me my wages, whatever I am worth, but only if you want to. So they counted out my wages, 30 pieces of silver. We even see the final outcome where the money was paid to Judas to betray Jesus is used to buy the field where Judas was buried. It's called the potter's field. And that's mentioned in the Bible a thousand years before him. He gave the money to the potters. It was the potter's field he bought. And this is where he was buried. Judas did play a key role in the arrest of Jesus. The leaders were afraid of the crowds who loved Jesus and they couldn't arrest him in the temple. And they didn't know exactly where Jesus went with his disciples. They would have to have a hard time identifying Jesus in the flickering torchlight at night in the garden. So Jesus betrayed with deep intimacy and trust the disciples shared. He violated the place of prayer and rest. And aside from betraying Jesus, these other details led to his deep remorse and his decision to end his own life. We know that the, you know, the Romans went to great lengths to invent and enhance cruel and unusual ways of punishing people. Unfortunately, in today's world, there are many governments and strong men who do awful things to people to prove a point, to change a behavior, to terrify people. Now, the Romans were brutally efficient in this tactic. For instance, if you go back to 71 BC, 6,000 slaves were crucified along the Appian Way. This is a famous regional road. They had joined Spartacus' rebellion and they were punished by the regime. They were lined up along 120 miles of road, a gruesome reminder of the power who, who they must submit to. It also said that Jewish rebels faced a similar fate in 4 BC when 2,000 were crucified. The point was humiliation and terror. So can you imagine that? 120 miles of crucifixions uh, because they went with Spartacus. Actually, I, did, I thought Spartacus was just a movie, but in fact, it's a biblical history point that that was true. And he led a rebellion of slaves against the Jewish, or against the Romans. Now, when the leaders of the Jewish council, the Sandrin compelled the Roman governor Pilate to crucify Jesus. It was the strangest arrangement 
because it shows the extent to which the leaders felt threatened and how much they despised Jesus. Since they felt the, humili the humiliation of the Roman occupation, it is one of the rare circumstances where they worked with Rome. And amazingly, counterintuitively, this outcome was exactly God's chosen path to undermine oppressive regimes and redeem humanity. The Romans weren't a problem. The Jewish leaders weren't a problem. But the power of sin and death, along with fear, hatred, jealousy, and a host of other troubled emotions, gripping the heart. These powers are the enemies. Jesus came to defeat, and he came to invite all people, the oppressors and the oppressed alike, back into what truly means to be truly human. And Jesus expresses this purpose in different ways. So in other words, Jesus is passing on this authority to you this evening, this eve of uh, the resurrection. You can invite Jesus into your heart so he can take authority over if you're oppressed in any situation. So join with me now in this short prayer. Once again, we're going to invite Jesus into our hearts. So Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe that you were crucified on Good Friday. I believe that you rose from the dead on Easter Sunday. And I invite you now, come into my heart and be my Lord and Saviour. You paid the price for the sins of the world and my sins. And I thank you, Lord, and I invite you to come into my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, that's, that's what God wants us, just to acknowledge what he did on Good Friday, on Saturday, and on Easter Sunday. He expresses, you know, our purpose in different ways. He says, one famous way that Jesus wants us to do, to be Christ-like, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And love your neighbour as yourself. Mark 12, 29. It's deeply meaningful the way Jesus died. The hymn to Jesus in Philippians Philippians 2, verse 5 to 11, it says, He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. You see, the Jewish leaders were capable of enforcing their own laws, executing someone by crushing them with rocks, as the law dictated, but they could not crucify. Jesus not only stepped into the human experience of death, he took on the death of a criminal but it wasn't a normal execution. It was humiliating, excruciating death on a cross for you and for me. He suffered the worst available torture to enter into the experience of the most vulnerable and most oppressed. The resurrection of Jesus overturned the undue verdict of death by crucifixion. He promised the same for those who trust his way of salvation. Once Jesus was replying to a, a trick question and Jesus clarified, he says, what about the resurrection of the dead? And his answer was, have you not read that God said to you, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Now, in Matthew Matthew 22, verse 31. The God of the living sees suffering and agrees him by his spirit. Jesus wants to enter into the most painful situation to bring peace and joy. So this is the message of the cross on this Easter Eve, or the eve of Easter Sunday. And it's a very important time in the Christian calendar. It's what separates us from the rest of the world. So if you need a peace in, in your life, just remember that prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. So have a blessed Easter. Have a blessed holiday. We'll be back with you next Saturday. And thank you once again for joining us. We'll talk to you then.